Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, this is episode number 18 uh, on the topic of heaven. And uh, I we've had 17 episodes already, obviously, and there's, they're two hours long, so we've already talked about heaven for 34 hours, and, and uh, we're only halfway through this study. So uh, there's a lot to learn about this. I hope if you're really interested in heaven, you go back and watch the previous seven, uh, 17 uh, videos and take your time and learn about heaven. There's nothing more joyful. There's no topic that you can study in theology that will give you such joy of knowing what uh, the future holds for uh, those of us who put our faith in Jesus. Uh, so uh, first, let's have uh, Brother Eric say hi to everybody. Hi, everybody. Jesus Night 72 here, and uh, happy to be here as always. Okay. Thank you for joining me, Eric. And uh, um, we still have quite a ways to go before we're finished with this topic of heaven, but we, we've planned ahead and decided uh, after the subject of heaven is completed, uh, we're going to take on a new approach on this show. Uh, we will still have several people on a discussion, uh, a panel of people, and the topic is going to be, we're going to take uh, 1 Peter 3.15 as the theme of the show, and that is ready with an answer. So if you have, uh, I'm going to ask everybody who watch all these episodes, over the next several weeks, uh, I want you to just make a list of any questions that you come up, come up with about theology. Any theological question at all, send them to me, and, and we'll accumulate a list of questions, and then when it's time to start that show, we will uh, attempt to answer those uh, through our group discussion format. So, 1 Peter 3.15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Now, I was very familiar with that verse, Eric, but uh, I really, for some reason, the following verse kind of... Um, I. I Missed it. I, I just had never. Uh, I wasn't paying enough attention. But the following verse is very pertinent to me right now because the following verse says not only be ready with an answer, but it says having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evil doers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. So uh, you know we want to be ready with an answer from the scriptures, but here's the problem. Anytime that we dare to answer a question on theology, we are just sticking our neck out there getting, so someone can come by and want to chop it off because we don't like the answer. But I'm ready to take that risk. How about you, Eric? Oh, absolutely. Um, I, I don't want to say I don't want to say I, I kind of look for it, you know, but I mean, I, I always looked at it as the kind of thing where when you make an account and you're giving an account and people have problems with it, generally that's because you're usually doing something right. Um, it, it, you know, there's a saying that I happen to agree with. It's like if everybody loves you all the time, you're probably doing something wrong because that's not how Christians are generally, how God tells us Christians are going to be accepted. For instance, in this Peter reference where you're saying, where you're going to give an account for your faith, the faith you have, the I think it's very telling that the very next verse explains the kind of reaction you're going to get, you know, you're going to get this reaction of people wanting to cause strife, people want to, are angry with you. They want you, the enemy wants you to shut up. Okay, he doesn't want you to talk about this. He hates it, so he'll use any way he can to cause that to happen. So, really, I mean, I expect it. I expect it if I'm doing something right. If I'm if I'm witnessing in the way I'm supposed to, and I'm really given the message the way I'm supposed to about the reasons for my faith, and I, in good conscience, know why and how I'm delivering that message, I know Satan's going to hate it and he's going to want to crush it and he's going to want to attack me for it. So yeah, I, I am ready for that and you have to be. Um, it's just part of the, it's, it's you know, we say we're in a battle all the time, this is a war. Well, it's true and that's all part of it. You take steps forward and the enemy retaliates. The enemy wants to attack you for it. So it, that's just what it is. Well, I know that I'm going to put on the full armor of guard 
uh, God to in order to uh, have this uh, spiritual battle or argument. Now, an argument, uh, have, the word argument has a bad connotation. People think an argument means that you are um, angry, raising your right. voice. Hey, let's right. say hi to, to Brother uh, Jackson here. There he is. Hey, Jackson. Glad you could join us, Jackson. We're just start starting uh, the show, uh, episode 18 on heaven, but I first did a, a, a kind of a, a commercial for the next show we're going to do in the future called Ready, Ready with an Answer. So we're asking everybody to, over the next several weeks, to comp send us in all their theological questions, and we'll compile the list, and then when we're finished with heaven, we're going to be answering all those questions uh, in a uh, dialogue on the panel. Cool. What do you think of that? <laughs> but here's the, here's the interesting thing. I'll read it again for Jackson's benefit here. Uh, but uh, uh, we're basing this on a verse in First uh, Peter 3. Verse 15 says, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Now, you're familiar with that verse, aren't you, Jackson? Yes, yes. Okay. Now, I, I'm very familiar with that, and that verse has been of great inspiration to me to study and always be ready with an answer. But somehow the following verse just kind of uh, went over my head or something. And let's, I wonder if you're familiar with verse 16. It says, uh, once you're ready with an answer, it's, the following verse is, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. Uh, the point is that uh, if, as soon as we dare to attempt to answer theological questions, uh, you are just leaving yourself wide open for some kind of criticism and attack. So we have to understand that going into it. If we dare to answer questions, we're going to have some people want to argue. Yeah, we're, we're sort of like goalies in a hockey game. <laughs> <laughs> Try and block all those pucks. Yeah, those high-speed pucks coming at you constantly. Yeah. yeah. So, so we we, we got to make sure that we really have on all that armor of God when we. Oh, absolutely, that. absolutely. Okay, so right now we're going to uh, continue in uh, this book. Uh, uh, it's called Heaven by Randy Alcorn, and uh, we've been working our way through this book and discussing it. Uh, he starts off every chapter with a question, and and then chapter twenty two is where we are. The question is, how will we rule God's kingdom? And, uh, Eric, I'm skipping down to the following page. The subtitle is the question, Why God Created Mankind and the Earth. Mm -hmm. It says, in the end, uh, in, quote, I mean, this is the name of a book. In the end for which God created the world is the title of a book by Jonathan Edwards. It says, God has a disposition to communicate himself, to spread abroad his own fullness. His purpose was for his goodness to overspill his own being, as it were. He chose to create the heavens and the earth so that, in, so that his glory could come pouring out from himself in abundance. He brought a physical reality into existence in order that it might experience his glory and be filled with it and reflect it. Every atom, every second, every part, and moment of creation. He made human beings in his own image to reflect his glory, and he placed them in a perfect environment which also reflected it." Unquote. Now that's a quote by Jonathan Edwards from his book, The End for Which God Created the World. We're going to discuss that, but first thing I want to say is I found that uh, as we've been working our way through the book here, every time we quote some uh, theologian, uh, I, I, I don't know that much about Jonathan Edwards. I don't know about you guys. I've heard his name a lot over the years, but I've never really studied his theology. But mm -hmm. I, I, we may get a comment from someone, hey, how dare you even uh, quote Jonathan Edwards? He's a heretic for some reason. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if he is or not. But we're going to at least analyze this particular comment about what he said there. Yeah. Well, I think I think one of the important thing is it, just not, not to beat a dead horse with this quote thing, but, you know, like we say, you know, there, you know, uh, even a broken clock's right twice a day. 
Okay, you know, just because a person has a bad theology and bad belief doesn't mean every single thing that comes out of their mouth is incorrect necessarily. You take those little tidbits, you know, that, and glean from those little bits that are like, okay, now he's got it there, he's got it here, and you use those. There's nothing wrong with using those. Just by using his quote does not mean, for everybody watching and listening, does not mean that automatically using a quote by him were followers of Jonathan Edwards. I mean, it's you've got to stop going to this extreme thing. It's simply a quote that seemed to be a very inspired quote. I don't have a problem with that quote. Um, everything in that comment was basically the long form version of my answer which was for his glory. God created mankind and the earth for his glory. That's why he does most of everything that he does. Um, it brings glory to himself but it allows him, as I stated before, God is not only as wonderful and wondrous as he is but he's a sharing and a giving God. He doesn't hold everything back. He he gives us uh, you know as much as we are ready for at the time. And so to share what he can with us up to this point, he shares as much as he possibly can and that's what creation and mankind existing on the face of the earth is really all about. Amen. Amen. Uh, brother Jackson, what what do you, what do you think of John Edwards statement? Huh? What do you think of Jonathan Edwards statement that I just read? Uh, it seems to be to be pretty much in line with what I would say. Nothing about it jumps out as I totally disagree with that, at least. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, the thing about God's glory that uh, I've always felt is that, you know, they're one of the solas, the five solas, is uh, sola gloria. And that, that is the, the, the doctrine that all the glory is reserved for God. Man cannot should not try to steal the, God's glory. Right. The only one who shall, shares God's glory is Jesus Christ, because He is God. Uh, the person, uh, the person of Jesus Christ, is part of the Godhead. So uh, He and the Father and the Holy Spirit share this glory, but we can't take any share any of the glory. It's basically stealing, and that's why when someone thinks that they can get to heaven through personal merit by what they did. It's in a way saying, "I'm going to take some of this glory and credit for myself." So yeah, they they might as well change the hymn instead of "To God be the glory, to me be the glory." Great things I <laughs> yeah. have done. And, well, you know, that's a great point, Jackson. I think Luke, what you said is right too. It it leads invariably to why the, there's the line in scripture that says, "You know, pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall." Because in a way, pride oh. pridefulness is a way of um claiming glory for things that you can't claim. I mean, it's claiming greatness for what you can't claim. Yeah. Uh, so the, the, the first thing man has to realize is he has to be humbled and realize that mm -hmm. God's to be exalted and man is just, a, we're, we're a creature. He made us and he gets all the glory, and, but he did make us because he wants us to be magnificent. He mm -hmm. wants us to be his children and, and uh, uh, but but never take the position that we are, have the glory like God does. And the Bible says we all fall short of the glory of God. Right. This is this is the error, especially of groups like Mormonism, that thinks man can become God and everything. And other, I think other groups have also taught this deification concept. It's violation of sola gloria. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mormonism and and uh, you know uh, Buddhism through reincarnation thinks that man can uh, eventually become God uh, or a part of this co consciousness and oneness of God. Um, all right, and as he says, it goes on to say in the book, uh, Earth exists for the same reason that mankind and everything else exists to glorify God. God is glorified when we take our rightful intended place in His creation and exercise the dominion that he bestowed on us. God appointed human beings to rule the earth. Quote, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Uh, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, 
be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. That's Genesis chapter 1. So uh, uh, the, the, the subject of this chapter is how will we rule God's kingdom? And we've talked in the past that uh, man's place is, is to share in the reign we are co-heirs co and co-rulers with Christ. We discussed that in the last previous couple of episodes. And so here, and this is, this is a very important to understand that God's original intention was for man to rule over the earth. And, and even though we had the fall, and, uh, and it's necessary for redemption, man's redemption, earth's redemption, the, the universe's redemption, once that happens, the original plan is still in effect, and that is for man to rule over the earth. Is that a surprise to any of you, uh, either of you guys, or? Uh... To me, to me, it's just a confirmation of what I already knew um, to be the case. God, it, we, in fact, it's funny that we're reading this because of our conversation the other day over the phone. It's so funny. Uh, I mean, I didn't know this was coming in the book, and we were talking about, you know, Satan's great victory over mankind was our death, and him killing us. Uh, we were not made to die. God did not make us to die. He didn't make creation to die or perish. He didn't make it to do that. Um, it went against everything he designed. Uh, we had that. It entered when we did wrong, and we, uh, you know, uh, corrupted uh, this wonderful thing he had created through disobedience. Um, so it's really interesting because the intent was always there, and God doesn't simply take his plans and trash those plans and forget it. Uh, he he restores things. He brings things back. He makes them better than they originally were supposed to be. But he he goes back. He you know the saying in scripture we hear: God doesn't forget his covenants. He doesn't forget the promises he makes. Uh, you, you're familiar with the theological concept of the parentheses. I may be. I just may never have heard it called that. Well, a, a parenthesis just means that uh, you, the one one application of the parentheses is the idea of uh, uh, the uh, the seventh the seventieth week of Daniel. Mm -hmm. The seventieth week is put off. You have the sixty nine weeks, yes. and then you have what's going on now in the church age, and then and then the seventieth week comes later. So we have the yes. church in the middle is the parentheses, right? And I think this is also another form of the parentheses in that you have God's original plan, and then the fall is the parentheses, and then we're at a stage in the book now where uh, uh, God gets it back on course. Uh, right. Man is redeemed, the universe is destroyed and then re renewed, and we have a new heavens, a new earth, and this is in eternity on the new earth that we're talking about right now, and so now God's original plan is is back in place and yes. working right the way it was. And, and this and this pattern has been seen all through Scripture. You, you don't have to look too hard to go back in the Old Testament to see all these places where there have been parentheses put, where things have been on hold. Um, the, 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 the Israel coming into the promised land, they didn't in obvious way, not get the promised land. They simply had it put on hold. There was a parentheses there. It was put on hold until all the things to be accomplished to bring all things to fulfillment. So those things never got forgotten. And this is why the people who want to say, well, we got to ditch Israel and Israel doesn't apply uh, today is completely false. God does not just ditch his chosen people. He has made promises. Those promises will be kept. They're just put on hold right now until the proper fulfillment is supposed to come. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... Let me, let me also read a verse that I think is, is relevant here. Okay. This is Isaiah 45, verse 18, which reads, For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it, he created it not in vain, he formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is none else. Mm -hmm. So it says that he, he made it, he made it not in vain. He, he he made it to to be inhabit to be inhabited and everything. And 
if God is, it seems very consistent. I mean, obviously, we couldn't build this theology off of just this one verse, but with, given with all kinds of other things we've read, it seems very consistent that he would uh, would would want this again, ultimately, if his will ultimately comes to pass and everything. If he created it not in vain, why would it forever continue in vain? Exactly. Yeah. Um, I think I could I could uh, say that the, um, the the phrase "it is written" could apply to this too. Is that um, once it is written, then then we know that uh, you know it's as good as done. And, and God's description of of how this whole timeline plays out is all recorded in the scriptures. And then once it's written, then you know that that's the way it's going to be because God is not limited to a linear, linear timeline. He's outside of time observing and sees everything. So when he writes it down, it's, it's as though it's already happened. Mm -hmm. So we know that the, uh, the way that uh, we're, we're talking about uh, the end times and the new heavens and the new earth, that's the way it's going to be because uh, God wrote it. Uh, God's intention for humans was that we would occupy the whole earth and reign over it. This dominion would produce God-exalting societies in which we would exercise the creativity, imagination, intellect, and skills befitting beings created in God's image, uh, thereby manifesting his attributes. To be in God's image involves a communicative mandate that through our creative industry as God's sub-creators, we should together make the invisible God visible, thus glorifying him in the sight of all creation. <clears throat> What's your reaction to that uh, statement? <clears throat> you know, that's an interesting take because, you know, unless you really ponder these things, you, you tend not to think of them that way. And... You know, by God creating man in his image, it's much more than showing how important we are to him. It's him giving us a glimpse of himself through us. Um, that's pretty humbling right there. I mean, the fact that God would want to do that, it would want to be such a loving God, to, you know, to bestow his creation is something that is as lowly as we are, um, to, in his, to be in his image. That's pretty. I mean, to me, that's that's a. There's a lot of love that goes into that. You know, that, that God would reveal Himself through us. Mm -hmm. well, you know, we've talked about uh, this uh, triunity of God, the Godhead, uh, numerous times in, in previous shows. Uh, and, and but but let's not neglect to cover this again. This I think this is important enough to keep repeating. Uh, and that is this. It says, "Let us create man." in our image. Uh, how does that, that's the first expression of this Godhead. So wh how do you react to that? Uh, Jackson? The, the, the phrase create man in our image is, is one that's been debated a lot over the centuries and everything. I, the way I kind of look at it is we're, I, that we're, we're all trinities like God is and everything. Yeah, that, I, I agree. I, that's, that's how I see it. Uh, you have one God and, and he, he, God exists in the form of uh, this triune God, which is a Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all equally God, uh, three persons and yet one God and, and uh, some people hold the idea that this one God just changes forms to from one form to another but there's three forms three manifestations that's called modalism so whether it's modalism or tr Trinitarianism uh, we still have the concept of one God and these three different uh, persons or manifestations of God Father Son and Holy Spirit and uh, I think the analogy of man being created in God's image fits perfectly because we know that Eric has three parts and yet he's one person. He has his body, his soul, and his spirit. Uh, and Jackson has a body, soul, and spirit. And yet there's only one Jackson. So, I think this is another good argument for Trinitarianism because we can't transform into three different things. I'm not Jackson one day, a cat the next day, and a dog the next day. 
<laughs> That's true. Very true. Uh, uh, there's another point here. We got a little off on that tangent, but I think that was important to, to make that so everybody can understand that this is the first reference in the scriptures that we can uh, conclude this triunity, this Godhead. But there, the point he's really making in this paragraph is, it says, uh, we are uh, God's sub-creators. Now, you know, there's a lot of things that maybe any one of us say or that we read in a book. And people are looking for every opportunity to, to take our words and, 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 uh, and for, start an argument over it. And I can see this as a potential, uh, you know, argument. Some people say, how dare you say that we are sub-creators? But how do you think Randy Alcorn is using this term in the in this context? The uh, the only uh, there's no problem with the term sub creator. Um, the the if he had used co creator, then they would have a problem. We're not we're not co creators. We are sub creators. We create as best we can with the things that we're given in our minds, physically, technology, um, uh, all the things that we. We were made to take joy in creating, just like just like God expresses. He had a lot of joy in creating. Um, that's simply a trait. Um, by saying we're sub creators, is is it's a, that'd be nitpicking to have a problem with that because you're using the term sub creator to purposely put us under him, not to make us equal with him. He's not saying co-creators. He's saying sub-creator. We are we are under him. We we like I said, we create with what we're given. Mm -hmm. Oh, Eric, uh, Eric's good analogy, or good explanation, I should say, there, has me thinking about the Lego movie. <laughs> I, didn't see the movie. I didn't see the movie, Jackson. Tell me what you mean. Go and watch that movie. It's very, it, it's very clean and everything, so I can recommend it publicly to Christians even and stuff. It's a very clean, fun movie. It's got really good reviews, it is. Yeah, it, 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 the nice thing is it has a lot of lines, even though it's a kid's movie, a lot of lines only adults could really understand and stuff. Yeah. Is, it, yeah. is it real current? Yeah, uh -huh. it's in theaters right now. But okay. it's like, because what it's like is, you know, you've got the master builders are people who, I mean, all these are t all, all these are actually built by people outside of the Lego world, but the master builders are people who can build, like Lego people, who can build really, really well. Got people, and I wonder if this is sort of, a, a, you can kind of picture this like being a sub-creator or everything, because even the lowest person can build things, but the master builders might be like the disciples who set, who's laid down their lives for Christ and everything. Mm -hmm. So uh, being the highest sub-creators or something. Hmm. Well, uh... I think that uh, Randy, in this uh, context, is, is talking about man's innate creativity. Now, if, mm -hmm. if I was going to describe um, you guys, uh, uh, I could, I could uh, assign all kinds of adjectives to you. Uh, I can say you're ambitious, or you're diligent, you're hardworking, you're, or you're thoughtful, or you're considerate, or you're creative. You know, this is a, this is an adjective, and I think every person does have a certain degree of creativity, and, and obviously that's that's a, a common way of referring to any person. Oh, he's very creative, and we know that some people have a lot more creativity than than, than others. Uh, so it is part of man's uh, being to be creative. And, and whether we're creating things through all of our technologies, all of our inventions, being inventive or creative is the same kind of a thing, principle. All right, uh, skipping a little bit, it says, uh, the next page, it says, this reigning, expanding culture, enriching purpose of God for mankind on earth was never revoked or abandoned. It has only been interrupted and twisted by the fall, but neither Satan nor sin is able to thwart God's purposes. Christ's redemptive work will ultimately restore, enhance, and expand God's original plan. So here he's making the point that I was making earlier about this parentheses. Mm -hmm. You know, God's plan wasn't thwarted. It was just temporarily delayed, and we're in this parentheses or delay period before it, the plan gets really completed. 
Uh, then I say, uh, we need to carefully, we need to think carefully when we read scriptures that talk about, quote, uh, the world, unquote. I recommend adding the words as it is now under the curse to keep the biblical distinctions clear in, my, in our minds. He gives examples. Friendship with the world uh, is hatred toward God. But Randy Alcorn adds, friendship with the world as it is now under the curse is hatred toward God. And then he, and he that was James 4.4. 4. And then he gives another example, do not be conformed to this world, uh, that's Romans 12.2, but Randy would say we should think of this as do not be conformed to this world as it is now under the curse. His final example is 1 Corinthians 3.19, it says the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, but Randy says the wisdom of this world as it is now under the curse is foolishness with God. Do uh, you think that's an important distinction to, that he makes there, maybe putting it in that uh, uh, that kind of context? I, I think I think it helps to have the clarity because you can't have those people who, again, who want to nitpick and say, no, this means the, the world at all. The world as it was, the world as it is now. But clearly, if you, if you look at those uh, those verses in context and with the re the rest of scripture, you can clearly see is talking about the world in its fallen state. Yeah, I have in mind. Uh, you know, a lot of times, Eric, we were talking about how if I ask a question and you say, "Well, you have an advantage, Luke, because you already have a you already have an answer in the back of your mind." <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> I do. I do have an answer already in mind when I answer the question. Not that my answer is, uh, you know, the cor correct one or only one. Um, but uh, when we when we talk about uh, when he cites these examples, um, I see a potential uh, problem when a person uh, and the reason that he clarifies it in this way is is because there is a potential problem that can result from people taking these verses and how far could they take these verses so that it becomes a problem the way that people see the world. Well, if, if if using the term world is used vaguely, like I said, you could make it mean lots of different things. Um, it, it's it, this may be one of those times where um, I don't I don't know myself because I don't know enough about the Greek and the other writings these were originally written in. It may pay to look at some of the histories of the words that are actually used themselves to see. What, it may it may lend a little bit more to the clear, clarifying that verse as it was written originally. I, I don't know, um, but I think clearly, you know, friendship with the world is hatred towards God. I mean, to me, I don't think it takes. You know, you don't need a, a degree in in theology to understand clearly that means the world in its fallen state. Um, you know, I mean. There would have been nothing loving the world um, if it was not fallen and originally the way God made it. He made it. Um, we should love everything he gives us. We accept all he gives us with thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I, I think I don't I don't I think it's a bit of a stretch if for people trying to say, you know, to say you can't love the world in any way. You know, yeah. the world the way it was before. In this particular verse. Uh, I think the world he's referring to people. Yes. Uh, just as uh, Jackson, I'm curious in your opinion on this. In John 3:16, for God so loved the world. Uh, do you think that that uh, he's referring to all the peoples of the world, or is he referring to the people, the earth, everything in on the earth, the world? You know, I'd be very, I'm very open to change my opinion. Opinion, if I if I see evidence of it, but I always took that as a reference to the the people on Earth. Yeah, I think it the, doesn't seem. It, and the the reason, let me just say why why that's my first impression, is because obvious it, it talks about him sending his only begotten Son. So, the, so in other words, so there's a Savior. Right. I mean, animals are not sinful. No. No matter how bad an no matter how bad. Um, so this is something my grandfather used to go over with me when I was a younger kid to try to understand this concept of morality. But no matter how bad an animal, uh, something happens that involves an animal, 
no no person other than maybe some mentally unst unsound person would say that animal is sinning. Like oh that like a shark eats a young child. Very sad, but we don't say that sinning shark. Mm -hmm. That shark is going to burn in hell. <laughs> right. And no, that, no actually also, actually Jackson, that's a great point. And again, it lends to that idea that animals have no control over their destiny. They don't they don't they can't make a decision to save themselves. So again, they need God's um, God's grace to do that for them. And that's another thing that Christ does. But as far as the verse you're talking about is concerned, all you have to do is read the rest of the verse to see what he's talking about. You know, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, so that all who believe in him would have eternal life. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's talking about the people. It goes right to the people. It doesn't talk about the planet. It doesn't talk about animals. It doesn't talk about anything else. It talks about people's decision that they may have eternal life if they believe upon him. Yeah. So I think it's clear. I think that that's true in, in, in the case of John 3.16, and I think in this case of James 4.4, 4, it's talking about uh, friendship with the world means the people of the world who are in this fall. Yes. But uh, uh, the, the idea that the, uh, uh, it's only the people that was redeemed is something we've learned through all of our studies now that it's, it's, redemption is broader than just mankind. Right. Re all of creation it gets redeemed and restored. The earth, the plants, the animals, the universe, everything. So we know that uh, the fall affected animals too, even though they don't need to be uh, like saved from sin and, and that, that. But and yet animals die because mm -hmm. because right. under the curse everything dies, and uh, so even animals were affected by it. So in the case God so loved the world, uh, I can see how a person could think it more broadly that all, you're thinking all of creation needs to be redeemed. But then he goes on to say in John 3.16, whosoever believeth shall not perish but have everlasting life. So in this particular case, obviously he's talking about fallen man being, being right. uh, saved. Right. Uh, but the, what I was getting looking for, I didn't give Jackson a chance to answer the question here. Do you see any potential problem, Jackson, with... Uh, these verses he cited here, these three, do not be conformed to this world, uh, friendship with the world is hatred toward God and so on. Uh, do you see any problems with those where a person can take it to a such an extreme that uh, that's why Randy needs to clarify, uh, do not be conformed to this world as it is now under the curse. Without that context, where could a person go with it? Well, I mean, I, I, guess, I guess there is potential there, but frankly, I think that with the way people live today and what we can observe around us, I think definitely most people are going to go the other direction and do exactly what these verses are telling them not to do and everything. Yeah. I think it's rare, to, let's just put it this way, I think it's rare to encounter a person who thinks that, the, that everything physical is evil than it is to somebody who's just conformed to this world, unfortunately, and everything, even, even Christians. Yeah. Well, when you said everything physical is evil, that's that's where I was going, and that's right. Like, I'm saying I'm saying I think that, that that there's a chance for that, but I think the numbers today, at least, would be very small. Yeah. Maybe not when the Gnost when Gnosticism was more popular and everything. Yeah. Uh, but but that that's where I was asking when you, I asked my question. That's the answer I had in the back of my mind. Going back to what Randy brought up earlier in the book, this problem of Christoplatonism. The idea that the physical world is evil, and therefore uh, the only thing way that we could really be in a pure state in, in heaven is to be in an ethereal, uh, non-physical uh, dimension rather than having physical existence, because everything physical is bad. So uh, I think. And by the way, uh, Jackson, there's a brother we love very much on YouTube that made a, a recent video about heaven, and and he. I think I'm afraid that he was making that point of view that the earth is not going to be the new earth is not going to be anything like this as we know see it now because it's all bad and so forth it's going to be new but new means totally different and uh, I think that new means that it's going to be very similar to the earth but without the fallen state it'll be perfect but it'll be much like what we have now all the beautiful things that we love about the earth so in other words it's like a person throwing the baby out with the bathwater and saying well, everything, uh, um, do not be conformed to this world, uh, friendship with the world, 
the wisdom of this world. In other words, if you don't say, uh, as it is now under the curse, then a person can just assume that everything physical is bad, and in eternity yeah. there will be no physical reality because all physical things are evil. Well, I think I think one of the things you need to do is you need to establish a precedent where that term is used before in the Bible, and it means what we're saying. And I just did that. I was, if you could tell, I was typing away. Um, I looked up the verse I knew in my head. I couldn't remember what it was, which is John fifteen eighteen. And John fifteen eighteen says, "If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you." Clearly, it's not talking about the planet and creation. The, the world doesn't hate anything. It's an inanimate object. It doesn't. It doesn't have a life force or anything like that. So clearly, he's talking about people. He's saying, if the world hates you, this is the world that he's talking about in these other verses, the same world, the world that we should not conform to, uh, this, this, um, the world that we should not love is that world that hates us. It hates us. It hated him before it hated us, and that was because of its evil and because of its rebellion through Satan. Yes. Good point. Uh, all right. So um, we, I think we all agree that there's nothing wrong with this world as, except for the fallen state of the world. If we hadn't, if, if the, we hadn't been under the curse, uh, the world would be perfect, and you know, we would love to be friends with the world, you know, back in the Garden of Eden, you know. But it's only because of the fallen state is that there's problems with the world because uh, all of creation has been affected by the fall. Uh, the, the world as it was and the world as it will be is exceedingly good. The world as it is now, inhabited by humanity as we are now, is twisted. But this is a temporary condition with an eternal remedy, Christ's redemptive work. So that's the point that Randy is making too, that... Uh, that's why he added, as it is now under the curse, and I, I think that is an important distinction to understand, because there are people that, that just think that everything in this world is bad. I mean, I've, I've known so many people that, that just think, this world is horrible. And I say, wait a second, I love the earth, I love creation, I love a lot of good things, I love you know, the art and, and music and, and, and all the foods and all kinds of things are beautiful and wonderful in this world. It's not 100% bad, but there is sin and evil, and there is the curse, and so it's not what it's supposed to be. And yet, well, they, what they don't see in that is that, that the reason they hate it is because of sin. If there wasn't sin, they wouldn't hate it. It's yeah. it's it's God when God created the earth again. We keep going back to this, and we keep on beating. I keep on beating this dead horse, but it's right there in black and white. When God created the world originally, He looked at His creation. He said it was good. He only uses that term, and Jesus. You know, tells us what that term means when we use it to say good. What is good? There's only one good but God. Well, when God created the world originally, it was perfect. It was perfect in the way that it was. It was meant to maintain its perfection and be perfect. But that got screwed up, like you said, the parentheses time period by the fall. So the reason you know, people say, well, I hate the world. I hate the way it is. Well, I can understand that side too. That's fine. You say you love the world. But you're looking at it from the angle of I look I love the world because first off God wants me to love those people that are even perishing because I want them to not perish and I need to love them or else I wouldn't want to help them if I didn't love them I wouldn't help them I wouldn't care what happens to them um, the creation itself you see the good things through that glass that we look through darkly you, you're able to see the good things that God started with the, the amazing things that creation accomplishes the amazing things the earth is so the other people are looking at it from the other side they're simply looking at it from all the effects of sin and saying I hate that and that's okay too to hate it because of the sin but understand why you hate it you don't hate it as a whole you hate it because of what it's become yeah yeah do yeah, you want to respond to that at all um, I, I, I largely agree with that. I, I, I don't think that uh, the three of us uh, uh, fail to appreciate our lives and the good things in our lives and in the world today. But I, 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 I know people, and I wonder if you know people, who have a totally negative attitude towards this life, this time, this 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 earth the, the current condition of everything they do, they see nothing good and only only the bad 
and they just all they want to do is just get out. All they, they, obviously, we all want to be in this state that we're talking about in the book, in eternity, in the new heavens and new earth. We're all excited and just really can't, almost can't wait. Of course, I can wait because I'm I'm, I'm going to go with God's plan. I'm not going to just shoot myself tonight and say I want to get there sooner. I, God has this time for me to be in that. So, uh, but there are people that seem to be they just can't wait to get out of this because they don't see anything good in it at all. Do you have you ever encountered people like that? Oh, I've I I myself do that sometimes because and it's when I take it's when I take my focus away from the things that I should focus on. Um, mm -hmm. I kind of focus on the, the evils that are happening, the times that we're unfortunately moving into. Well, fortunately and unfortunately moving into. Um, and I focus on those things. I tend to fall away from it, and then I find myself caught in that. I find myself caught in that, man, I'm done. I'm, I, I'm through with this. I want to be out of here. It's, it, I don't think it's a case of being guilty of doing something wrong. It's simply that you're, you're, shifting, you're shifting from the things, you know, Christ wants us to focus on the things that are that are going to make us productive. We can focus on prophecy. We can focus on the way the world's being right now. But we got to stay focused on Him, uh, so that we don't become despairing. You know, we don't we don't get that way ourselves. And because you know, and like I said, I'm doing that as a confession. I fully admit I find myself doing that sometimes. I don't need to look at other people to do it. I I myself do it. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm skipping ahead to the top, subtopic, Eric, is the kingdom transfer. Um, Daniel 7.25 says, uh, tells us that the saints will be handed over to the earth's kingdoms, which will persecute them for a season, but then a stunning reversal will occur. Quote, then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven uh, will be handed over to the saints, the people of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all rulers will worship and obey him. Uh, the kingdom will be God's, yet he will appoint his saints as rulers under him, and they will worship and obey him. Uh, what is the, quote, greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven that will be handed over to the saints? I believe it includes all that makes the nations great. That would include, among other things, their, their cultural, artistic, athletic, scientific, and intellectual achievements. All of these will not be lost or destroyed, but handed over to the saints. As they rule God's eternal kingdom on the new earth, we will become the stewards, the managers of the world's wealth and accomplishments. Um, He's surmising a lot, isn't he? Uh, but I don't, I don't find any fault in anything he's he's saying. Uh, but you can take a, a little bit of scripture that you know we're going to rule and reign, uh, co-rule, co co-reign with Christ, and that uh, we're going to be stewards of the earth. And and then you have to say, well, how far does this go? And do you think that? Uh, these things in our cultures and the government in, a, in the new heaven and new earth on an attorney, they will, st will still retain uh, these things, the culture, artistic, athletic, scientific, intellectual achievements. You guys still there? I yeah, think Jackson, it'll be uh, more. We'll let Jackson go. <laughs> I've, I've always thought it would be more like a kingdom than what we have today. Like, I wouldn't call the United States a kingdom. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and yet uh, there are, even in a kingdom, you have uh, cities within the kingdom, and you have uh, like mayors, or I don't know what in a kingdom they're called, but you have leaders over a city. And we know right. that we're told that some people will rule over one city, one over five, one over ten cities. So there will be some form of governing authority that is in place, and we know that uh, we saints uh, will be given these various positions to, to co rule. Uh, but my, my wondering is, uh, how much of our culture, science, uh, athletics, art, things like that, will be retained? Do you think any or much of it at all? I, I, I go the other direction with that. I think the potential of all those things will finally be unlocked. Right now in our state, we have limited knowledge, limited ability. There's only so much we can do in these fallen bodies and with this fallen planet. And without acknowledging God in science, 
in in all these arenas, you know, we're we're always held back from the potential that all those things have. But once everything is completed and everything is um, accomplished and perfected, all those things are going to be unlocked, and the untapped potential for all those things is going to increase. It's going to become something we can never understand because we, by our sinful nature, hold ourselves back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, as we go through the remainder of the book, we're, there, he's going to ask a, a lot more uh, specific questions that the common person who's not really a theologian would ask. Like the question that was asked to me the other night when I had some friends over for dinner, they're asking me, well, what age will we be in eternity? And what about children? What age will they be? Will they be adults or children? Uh, and these, these questions and many others like those will be answering, or discussing at least, whether we come up with a concrete answer or not, I don't know, but we will be discussing them in all these few coming chapters. Uh, but what we've done up to this point has been much more um, theological concepts about, you know, seeing the face of God and, uh, you know, uh, the the, realm, the physical realm versus the, you know, other dimensions. And, and uh, it's been really uh, very... Uh, uh, I think we lost him. Yeah. <laughs> He wasn't wearing his glasses this time. Yeah. <laughs> it's about the, I think this is the third time it's happened without glasses that I've ever seen. <laughs> he should be back shortly. Yeah. But that's what, you know, my point as far as what he was talking about was, um, you know, as far as mentioning the intellectual achievements, we're really, I, I see us as really limited. We're really limited because of all the things that are wrong, <laughs> you know. What I mean, and and because of that, we're held back from the potential that we have. Uh huh. Yeah, like I, I wonder if they'll. The answer to that question. The answer to that question is, I don't know at what age we're going to be. When we're at. I mean, I don't know. There's nothing concrete to tell us that. Um, but oh, he's back. There he is. Yeah. yeah, it's probably 30 seconds I missed, so I don't know what got you guys said in the, while I was gone. Yeah, we were just kind of rehashing what we talked about before. I wanted. I didn't want to get too far from your thought if you remember what you were trying to say. <laughs> yeah. The, the 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 point is, uh, these are a lot of the kinds of questions. I hate to say the common person because we're a different kind of person than your average Christian I think we're the people that just really love to study the scriptures talk about it all the time think about it figure it out talk about Jesus all the time I don't think your typical Christian is quite as interested as we are in just in, in uh, delving into this as deeply as we are uh, most Christians most even non-Christians would even just ask well what about my my pet my pet cat that I love so much can can I have my cat or my dog in heaven, or or what age will my child be in heaven? You know that that died when they, she was five years old. You know, right. uh, these are the kinds of questions. But this is the first sampling that I'm seeing in the book that we'll, we'll be getting into much more of this, and that is how much of our art, our science, our sports, our entertainment, all these things will that have any place in eternity? Will it be all be, be dismissed and discarded, or uh, all of the creativity of man throughout our history uh, is that just going to be saying, well, that was in vain? It, it, there's no value or interest in that in eternity. No, I don't think so at all. I, th I, th I think there's definitely going to be a use for those things. Um, one, one of the first things God did when he put man on the face of the planet was to use his imagination to name the animals and tend to the things on, on earth and to be fruitful and multiply. And they, they had every intention of building building cities and eventually doing those things. So no, why, why would he spark in us creativity again? I've raised this question before, but why would he spark in us creativity to just take all that creativity away? And sports and things like that and, and technology and intellectual things, artistic things, those are all things that are sparked in our imagination that, that God's given us. Mm -hmm. uh, Jackson, have you ever thought about that? Do you think that uh, there'll be any need 
uh, or place for technology? Uh, what about art, theater, sports? What about Legos and video games? <laughs> yeah, I thought about a lot of this stuff, actually, and I wonder what it, what it really comes down to, believe it or not to me, is how old will everyone be in heaven? Uh-huh. Well, that's an interesting question. That Can you guys still hear me? All right, because <laughs> I thought I went off for a second. But uh, uh, we'll, I don't know if we should jump ahead to that or not, because that's going to be something we discuss uh, in a future chapter. But, yeah, I think that is very relevant, uh, because if there are children in heaven, then obviously their, their interests and their degree of, of, of what they're going to be doing is going to be different than adults. And the, the people I was talking to the other night at dinner, uh, they they were quite a bit older than me. And I was just thrilled that uh, uh, the opportunity came up. They opened up the door, and I didn't uh, I didn't uh, uh, miss the, the the fact that hey, they asked they made a good point. They basically they said I, the man said uh, I asked him what do you uh, why can't you start golfing? You're not too old to learn golf. And he says, well, with the time I have left, I want to. There's other things I want to do before I leave. And I said, you're leaving. Where are you going? <laughs> And he said, you know what I mean. I said, well, do, where are you going? And he said, uh, I don't know. I said, well, you don't, <laughs> don't know for sure. I said, well, I think I know, but I don't know for sure. And then that led into the whole conversation just so I could tell him what he needed to know. And uh, so, uh, but this, these people were old, and their questions were, well, what, about what age will we be? They didn't want to be old, you know. Mm -hmm. When they're in heaven, in eternity, and do you want to have an old body that's, you know, 70, 80, 90 years old and live that way in eternity? No. So, uh, Jackson, if, if that were the case, maybe it'd be good to commit suicide when you're in your prime, <laughs> so that you're. <laughs> Don't even <laughs> say that. No. Uh, <laughs> leaving a note saying, you know, I it's not that I'm unhappy with my life. I just really want to be young in heaven. <laughs> no. I, well, pe people are missing something. I, I don't think it'll matter how old you look. You'll be in the top physical prime you could ever possibly be, whether you look older or you don't. I mean, it's like it's it's you may maybe you'll look older, but you'll feel like in your twenties. I mean, it's you know it's it's. Well, why would you want to even look older? I I don't think it'll matter to you. <laughs> I mean. If you, I mean, think about it. One of the reasons that we we look older, you know, we care about looking older here, is because well, we know what comes along with it. I mean, we know what comes along with getting old, you know, pain and difficulty doing things, and it's you know. So, um, but you're not going to have any of that. So, I mean, I, my personal, and I'm just guessing, you know, my personal take on that has always been, no, we're probably going to probably going to be, you know, middle aged, you know, looking individuals that, you know, that that's always been my I've Mike always thought we about it. look like we're around 25 or 30. Yeah, or right. Yeah, young 30s or, or yeah. late 20s or something, something of that nature. I mean, I could be totally wrong, but I mean... Well, I'll tell you this. Uh, Dr. Peter Ruckman, uh, who I've referred to many times in these studies, um, he is convinced that we're going to be 33 years old in eternity because the scriptures say that we're, we'll have resurrected bodies and Christ is the prototype and we'll be like him, and he was 33 at the res his resurrection. Mm -hmm. So maybe 33 is the perfect age to be uh, your, at your prime, I guess. I don't know, uh, but we'll we'll go into that more in future chapters. Uh, but there's a lot of people who would say, well, why would we even have like sporting events, or why would we have, you know, music, uh, you know, theater and art and 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 Legos and video games? These things are trivial, and uh, we'll we'll. Uh, so, will some of our hobbies and interests, uh, science and stuff, be retained, or, or will there be no need for the, for that or no uh, interest? In other words, why do you need technology if if you can just will things to grow, with, and you don't need tractors and the advanced tractors for farming to grow things? Uh, and if what do you need? Uh, railway systems and uh, airplane systems if well, you can just appear magically appear one place or another. And I and I have an answer for that question for people. Yeah. Um, why did God create the earth? Did He need it? No. He didn't need to make the earth. He didn't need to make us. Why did He create us? Because He could. 
because he wanted to for the fun of it, for the experience of it, for the creativity of it. Why do people have? To, why do people God, have to? God ins- did it for the fun of it. For well, the why fun do? Of it. Why, why do people have to insinuate that heaven doesn't have isn't fun? Wait I think second. I think okay. heaven I think heaven is going to be one of the most fun places we've ever been to. It's going to be like one of the greatest amusement parks we've ever experienced. Wow. That's what I think it's going to be like. Yeah. Okay, I, I I think so. Some of these things we just have to speculate, and um, we can't we can't really declare what the answer is. We can just you know uh, propose ideas. Uh, I'm going to. I really don't think that committing suicide when you're young to get there though will have any. <laughs> Give you any advantage? No, I don't think so, no. Jackson. Plus, you're it's gonna well, be you're, something you probably have to answer for. You're 21, aren't you, Jackson? Yeah, almost 22. Yeah, I think you better wait at least 10 more years, uh, 10, 10, 11 more years before you re- rethink that, because you've got to be like at your prime and your peak. But then some people would say, well, if you committed suicide, then you you can't go to heaven because that's a mortal sin. Mortal sin is suicide, right? Yeah, what garbage. <laughs> well, no, we're not Roman Catholics. We don't believe in mortal sins. We believe we're all also, of We're also not condoning suicide, so please, you know, this is all in jest. It's not, you know, it's like we're not yeah. condoning it. Yeah, it's weird that we're yeah. jesting about suicide, but, it's, you know. Hey, well, we're trying to make light of a light of a very dark situation. It's well, no, 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 no. <laughs> for, me, it's not, for me, it's not jest or it's not, like, condoning or anything. It's asking a serious question of how old people will be in heaven. Well... Yeah. Is, are you really going to be the age when you die, that you are when you die? Is my is is the whole point of this discussion to yeah. me? Yeah. And I don't think the answer to that is yes. Is what I'm well, saying. Well, I'm just putting forth the idea that we'll be 33, and then we'll come to there's a chapter on that later. So we'll 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 go into that more detail later. Um, I'm going to the, the topic now is an ever expanding government. So we know that we're going to co-reign and co-rule with Christ, and and. That's what we'll talk about now. God say, says of the reigning Messiah, uh, of the increase of his government in peace, there will be no end. Isaiah chapter 9. What does this mean? If it was simply that the Messiah's reign will never cease, it would more likely say his government shall never, his government shall never end. Uh, that's true, of course, but it's not the point of the text. Uh, If it means only that his government shall be an all-encompassing, it might say, uh, of his government authority there will be no limit. Uh, That's also true, but again, it's not the point. The key word in Isaiah 9-7 is increase. Nearly every major English translation of the Bible renders the Hebrew word marbeth as increase or expansion. In other words, Christ's government of the new earth and the new universe will be ever expanding. How could that be? Ever expanding. What do you mean is, is going to be ever expanding? I mean, how long does it take to establish a government just on the earth itself? You know, uh, uh, do you think, it could, what does he mean by expanding, increasing in size? And, I think he, he I think he describes it there. He says he t- he's talking about the universe as we expand throughout the universe um, that that government will expand. It will it will stretch out to those areas, those to planets, galaxies, solar systems that it, it will expand out um, forever constantly. So we know that the, the the new earth will have a capital city called the New Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. And then we th- I guess we're concluding here that or assuming that the universe will have a capital planet, which is the Earth, the new Earth. And then there's the new heavens, which is all of the solar systems and galaxies and universe that's going to be recreated. Uh, is that there for no purpose? And, and we're, I guess we're speculating now is, wait a second, what about the rest of the universe? Is the, his government increasing and expanding, never, never ending? Does that, it would obviously have an end. It doesn't expand if it's limited to the Earth. Only if it's continued to span beyond the Earth could there be no limitation to it. What do you think, Jackson? Um, it makes me wonder if there's space exploration in heaven. Did you ever see Battlestar Galactica? Uh, I've seen other space operas. I don't think I've seen that particular one. Oh, okay. 
Battlestar Galactica is my favorite all-time show. With, yeah. With, uh, uh, what's his name, James Olmos. His first name's what, Robert or William? Or Edward. Mm -hmm. Edward James Olmos plays uh, the, the captain, uh, Adama. Uh, mm -hmm. It's an awesome show, but the interesting thing is that it was written and produced by Mormons who brought in all kinds of Mormon theological concepts. And, uh, it was very interesting, though. Uh, but that the point is, the universe is, is very, very large, and will there be sp space exploration? Will there be, uh, what do you call it, when you ex go out and uh, explorers, and not just exploration, but a pilgrim is the opposite, isn't it? A pilgrim is coming home, or is that going out? I think that's going out. You're talking, are you thinking of the word sojourner? Yeah. Sojourning? Sojourner, yeah. or whatever it is, but uh, the whole idea here is, could it be that uh, this, the, the, our, our Lord's government will never stop increasing because it's expanding throughout the universe, and that we, as co-rulers and co-reigners co with him, that we'll have a place in that too. I think that would be fascinating. I mean, obviously, I'm just it's just mind-boggling what I can see on the earth. Exactly. And then to think what there could be <laughs> right. uh, uh, in the universe, which even the concept of a universe is mind-boggling when we understand distances right. and time travel, have tra being able to travel from one end of the universe to the other. Right. Uh, if it even if the universe does have a uh, uh, boundaries, I don't know, but it, it's so immense that uh, the 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 wonders would be uh, even meet beyond what we could imagine here, just limited to the Earth. Uh, even if the new earth were many times the size of the present one, wouldn't every inch of it immediately or eventually be under his control and under ours as his representative? <coughs> if so, it wouldn't be every, ever expanding. So what can it mean? There are two ways in which a government can increase. One, by expanding into previously ungoverned territories, or two, by increase, uh, by creating new territories, an option not available to us humans. So that poses the idea, is, maybe, is God going to continue to create after he creates the new heavens and earth? Maybe he will continue. Of course, <laughs> it, it's so vast, why does he need to create? Once he creates the new heavens... I don't understand why you'd have to continue going and creating, but you know, eternity is pretty long, isn't it? <laughs> it's a long time. <laughs> yeah. So maybe throughout eternity, we'll even exhaust the universe, and God will have to expand the universe. <laughs> and that's where you begin as it begins to start blowing your mind. It's like I I, I can't comprehend that. Yeah. Uh, it may be that Christ's government will always increase because he will continually create new worlds to govern and perhaps new creatures to inhabit those new worlds. Uh, or perhaps it will always increase because the new universe, though still finite, may be so vast that, uh, that what Christ creates in a moment will never be exhaustively known by finite beings. From what we know of our current universe, with billions of galaxies containing millions of billions of stars and untold planets, this is certainly possible. The restoration of the current universe alone will provide unimaginable territories for us to explore and establish dominion over to God's glory. One thing like uh, stood out to me that I thought is a, a, you know, I'm always on guard that we, we say something that someone's going to pick out and uh, attack, but. Uh, uh, maybe I'm just like gun shy or paranoid. <laughs> uh, but it says that, uh, and perhaps new creatures to inhabit those new worlds. Mm -hmm. uh, what about that as a possibility? Do you think that, you know, what God has done on the earth, creating man in his image, that he'll do this again? on other planets, other worlds, since the universe is so big, uh, will it be limited to this co-creation experience that we've gone through here? Uh, will he repeat it? I, I think I think he definitely will. I, I, think, I think it's why he started it to begin with. You know, he shows us all the ways he creates in the in, in 
the amazing ways, ways he creates life on the earth. There is no reason anywhere in Scripture to believe that he wouldn't do that. There, there, there's nothing to say that he would not do that. Um, you know, of, of all things, God is the most amazing creator that's ever existed. He cre he's created all life. He has created all species. He's created the way these species thrive and the way they, they, um, they expand. The universe itself now expands. The elements that make up all the universe the, and how these elements interact with each other. I mean, there, there is nothing in Scripture, nothing, to, to say that God has put the kibosh on creating. He's not going to create anything any else. He's not, not doing it anymore. Why? Why would he not do that? It doesn't really make any sense. Okay. It, it, and there's there's another side of that. Jackson wrote a message that he'll be right back. Oh, okay. um, perhaps, perhaps we'll have a hand in this. Perhaps he'll share with us some knowledge of creation. I mean, uh, you know, what limited ability. I mean, who knows what our capability will be at that point. Maybe this is something he's going to share with us in the future. He always intended to, but never got the chance to because of the fall. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When he gets back, let me know because I want to hold a question for, for when you both are here uh, that I have. Um, he's I back. Have. There he is. Oh, okay. Um, so, Jackson, I asked Eric uh, to answer this point that uh, uh, Randy Alcorn is making here. He says, perhaps even new creatures – that God will create, and we're saying, well, make, will God repeat this? Some people call this an experiment, or this, but it's not an experiment. It's a this um, uh, a reality that we he created here on Earth, uh, the that creating man in His image, and then all of it, man's existence, our history, and to, to get this point where we're in this uh, eternal state in the in the new heavens and new earth, will God do that again? And and uh, with other creatures in his image, or maybe different. Do you think that's a possibility? And and after you answer that, I have a follow-up question. But first, let's say hi to your brother Mike. Hi, Mike. Hey, how's it going? Wonderful. I'm 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 saved and I'm blessed. What else do you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> well, well I, I, I'm good for the minute then. Uh, yeah, Jackson, what, what are you guys talking about? Uh, well, let me uh, let me see if Jackson can answer these questions, and then you can you can join us where we are. Uh, Jackson, I'm having a little bit of difficulty understanding the question. Actually, okay. Uh, okay. Let's. Randy says in his book, he says uh, it may be the Christ government will always increase because he will continually create new worlds to govern, and perhaps. New creatures to inhabit those new worlds. Oh, I now, you were, we're assuming, we're assuming that uh, uh, these new worlds and this universe that Gino. mankind. Keep it down, Gino. Yeah, we're assuming that these people who are going to be expanding the government will be us from the earth. But Randy's saying, well, what if God creates new creatures to uh, inhabit those other worlds? Uh, and uh, after you answer that, I want to, I have a follow up for you, Jackson. Um, I don't. I, I guess I don't. It's not impossible that that uh, he could create new creatures to do it. I mean, it's speculative for sure, but I don't see something sort of either way that that, that argues against either side that I can think of offhand. Yeah. Now uh, there are people that would even say that even discussing such possibilities somehow is, is, is some form of heresy. In the I don't know why, because as you said in scriptures, it doesn't say one way or the other whether we are currently the only creation of God or that in the future that he won't create others like us and other planets. We don't know that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's not it's not divulged to us in scripture. Oh, wow. and, and a man can only uh, guess, but some people want to get dogmatic about that. I've asked, I've asked people uh, in the past, People who say, "Well, there's got to be life on other planets," and I said, "Well, first of all, uh, to be life on the planets, the planet has to have a perfect world that is fit for life, in terms of gravity, radiation, uh, distance from the sun, the waves, and, and if you really look at all the things that are required, this perfect balance of nature uh, that is needed, 
Uh, it oh. is it is so precise. Yeah, I'll do it. Mike, how about muting that, will you? Because we get a lot of distractions. Sound. Good at me, actually. Muting. Oh, my little brother. Yeah, no, mute your mute your microphone so we don't hear it at least until you're ready to talk. Okay. All right, you there? Okay. Yeah, yeah. There. Okay. Yeah, when you're ready to talk, Mike, then just unmute it, okay? Uh, but it, there was it was I couldn't hardly talk because I couldn't he hear myself. Um, but so I've always argued that wait a second, uh, for life to exist, the conditions have to be so finely tuned that the mathematical odds of it reach impossibility, and that's why it's a miracle that we have life here on Earth. And it's impossible to have it on other planets because of the mathematical chances of it ever being this, this conducive for life. Uh, and yet, uh, I think that there's nothing in the scriptures that, that says, one, that God did not already do this before. That there are mankind as we are here on the earth, that there's no... Uh, sign in the scripture saying that he didn't do this already somewhere else and there's nothing to say that he's not going to do it again on some other planet in the future. Uh, what do you think of that? The, the only thing that I have um, have a little bit little bit of issue with is I thought I, I've always thought that when the new heavens and the new earth come in sin is gone forever like I I, I have hard time imagining he created another world where they would fall again, and this whole thing would sort of repeat as a loop or something like that. Yeah. I don't. Well, we we know that we're, this is talking about a new heavens, the new heavens and the new earth. The earth is this planet. The heavens refers to our universe. Now uh, we know that science say that there there's like uh, maybe twelve dimensions now instead of instead of uh, three dimensions, height, width, and depth. They think that there's like 12 dimensions or 13 dimensions and some scientists are surmising that there are dual universes too so let's expand this and say apart from our heavens which is our universe let's say that why does why could not God have another uh, another heavens and earth it's another universe he did he's doing the same thing elsewhere or that he may do it again now this is very sci-fi hypothetical but there's nothing in the scriptures that says one way or another on any of this is there no, no. It's just that I, I think that, that that there there are things in scripture to act like the the new heavens and new earth will be the end of sin. Yeah, but that would be uh, I think that applies to our heavens and earth, our universe. Uh, so that's why I expanded it to a different universe because uh, I think your objection is is a good point because sin caused the the fall of the whole universe, not just man, not just earth, but the whole universe. That's why the whole universe has to be recreated. But that doesn't mean that another universe separate from ours uh, is not has not been affected by our sin. Mm -hmm. So what I'm getting at is that uh, even discussing like this, something like this, uh, I know people that all of a sudden they'll start twitching and, and just like knee-jerk reactions and don't even discuss such a thing that there's possibly uh, God's doing, it did this before somewhere else or that maybe God will do it uh, other places in the future, the same thing in another universe. Don't even discuss that. I can't cover my, like, cover my ears. But if yeah, are, you, are, you, are you familiar with David J. Stewart's website, JesusIsSavior.com? Uh, I'm familiar, but I not, I'm no expert on everything he's taught. But I okay. I, well, this isn't about necessarily his teachings or whatever, but it's just a kind of an interesting point that I read on one article on there that I thought might uh, might back up your point here. Is he always says to ask an atheist if they believe in aliens, and if they answer yes or they're open to the possibility of life on another planet or life somewhere else. He said, by alien, by definition, means otherworldly being, a being that exists over in this world. Why couldn't one of those aliens be God? Yeah. Is what he always says. So we really have to define what, an, what aliens or what life on other planet or what all this stuff actually means. Because remember, there's a lot of differences. Yeah. To Hold on. That, you said, because uh, uh, I'm. Yeah, I've, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Checked out that site quite a bit. That one of his articles says that. He believes possibly that it, aliens could be God, if no, I understood you correctly. Here's what he says. Here's what he says. He says to ask an atheist, because he was talking about, I was arguing on, on atheism. Oh, oh, ask okay. an atheist if they believe in aliens. 
or if they believe that open to the possibility of alien life? And he says yes. And he says, that, and, and in other words, most most atheists would probably say yes because most scientists are open to the possibility of there being life on other planets. And he says if they say yes, yes, because of the fact that what what the definition of what an alien is, an otherworldly being. Mm -hmm. Ask of how how do you know that one of those aliens could not be God is what he's saying. Yeah. Well, <laughs> by, think... by that definition, God is sort of an alien, and so are angels. Right. He's he's just he's making a point. He's being a little facetious, yeah. but what he's saying is he's he's saying why can't you just call that alien God? He is alien to this to us right now because we can't see and touch yeah. and and be with him. Um, so and he's he's being a little bit you know he he's but yeah I see his point. He's yeah. Uh, there, there is. We, we, well, the thing, the thing it's important to, to say here, Luke, is that people can't get that way with us about it because none of us are declaring this to be true. We're, we're, we're not declaring unquestionably, doggone it, this is the way it is, and that's it. We're simply asking the questions. We're simply, we're simply curious and 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 um, speculating on the possibilities. So we're we're not declaring this is the case. Mm -hmm. uh, if we were doing that, then I'd say those people have a point. But none of us are declaring that this is the way it's going to be. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, uh, Mike, uh, you get the gist of what we're asking here. Do you have anything to say about that? Uh, the question is, uh, scriptures do not address this, so we don't really know one way or the other. But uh, so, can we assume then that it is po a possibility that God did the same thing He's done with mankind here? He's done it before in another universe, or He'll do it. Uh, again, either in this universe or in another universe in the future. Yeah, I would I would say we could only speculate. We we can't yeah. know for sure one way or the other on that point. Okay, Mike, you have an opinion on that? Um, well, just from analyzing uh, some of the scriptures, how uh, it, it's been very personal with us in particular. Uh, if we if you take the Bible, I know some people. Uh, I won't go into the, the whole gap theory debate, but some people do believe in a pre uh, edemic race, and that they're uh, anyway. My point is that if you take it from a start to finish, that there that it doesn't appear at first glance to be pre civilizations like us in particular, and uh, now a. I agree. It's uh, we can only speculate on whether he's done this in other places, but I would say no. Going off of, by, back to the personal, uh, and I, I realize that Jackson. That's that's why I'm uh, I phrased it the way I did because I, I I respect that. I think there's a a lot of uh, interesting points made there that are, that are that are worth uh studying and praying on but um I I for the I'm losing my my train of thought oh has he done this in other parts of the universe I would say no because he's been very personal with us and it's you know he came manifest in the flesh we were we, you know we were made in his image I mean it's it's been on a very personal basis now could he have done that somewhere else it it, it is plausible from you know, we can't limit put place limits on God. We can't put him in a box and say, "Well, no, he hasn't." Uh, but we haven't given been given a uh, definitive proof that he uh, has either. So. Okay. Thank you. I I, I think that um, we it's wise to take the position that uh, since Scripture doesn't tell us one way or the other on this and some other th questions that we're curious about, that we should say that. Uh, uh, we wouldn't rule it out that he's done it before, and, and, and we wouldn't be dogmatic that he hasn't done it before, we'll do it again. Uh, we can't be dogmatic about that. Uh, but it's but Randy's a asked the question about expanding the government. The, the Lord's government will increase without end, it says in the scriptures. So if he's not going to in, uh, have other creatures in the in the creation governing helping to govern then it would would it be us that's the next question he says uh, is there anything in scripture anything we know about God that would preclude him from expanding his creation and delegating authority to his children to rule over it I can't think of anything can you yeah 
Didn't, uh, didn't he say, well, I know it was re in reference to the earth, but uh, like when we'll be priests and kings, so we'll, uh, we'll be given uh, authoritative roles. I don't, and once the millennial reign is over, I don't see why that wouldn't carry out to possibly other parts of the universe. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's just talking about expanding throughout the rest of the creation, which is the universe, and that makes perfect sense, actually. I mean, well, uh, this is this is uh, questions has come up because of uh, Isaiah nine seven, and it says, "Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end." And Randy is saying it, it does, doesn't apply towards end in terms of. Uh, a time frame is talking about end in terms of scope. That the scope of it will continue to increase, and uh, uh, if that's the case, then we, it's logical for us to say that yeah, we will not only be helping to rule on the earth, we will be co-rulers with Christ on earth. But if it's never going, if it's going to expand, it, it, it may very well be expanding uh, away from the earth too. Um, now here's something that uh, I underlined, so maybe this is important. It says, humans are made to be kingdom builders, but history demonstrates that when we try to build without God as king, our utopias become hell on earth. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, that's a... Uh, I, think, uh, I think I learned this principle from Ruckman, and that is that... Uh, uh, every form of government man has uh, ever had and ever will have will always ultimately be flawed and fail, failure because um, the only form of government that will end up being perfect will be a uh, theocracy in, in eternity where Christ is king. <laughs> you know, but when we, no matter what we do, if we have man as king, you know how Israel wanted their king, they weren't satisfied having uh, you know prophets, and so they wanted a king. And, and then, uh, then we came up with other forms of governments or uh, democracies, republics, and all kinds of different ways. Man has tried to rule. When man's in charge, we always end up failing. There will never be a utopia on earth until Christ is king. Unless you're Catholic. <laughs> what do you mean? They believe, they believe it's getting better. Oh that. yeah, yeah. Currently, uh, Catholics think right now that uh, we're, we're Christ, building the kingdom. They think Christ is king right now through the Pope sitting on his throne. The Pope is is uh, you know Christ uh, on earth. Uh, what do they? What's the term for that? Uh, the vicar of vicar. Christ. Yep, vicar. Okay. Uh, by rebelling against the King of Kings, mankind abdicated dominion over the earth. But Christ will restore us to the throne occupied so briefly by Adam and Eve. He will hand over to us the kingdom. He said to his disciples, quote, Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Unquote. Luke 12.32 So the point here is that uh, in this whole chapter has been that this government, Christ will set up a government, he'll be king, but all of us saints will have a role, we'll have varying degrees of responsibility, and and, uh, and then not only will we possibly be governing over the earth, but maybe this government will expand beyond the earth. We can only guess about that. Um, I would just like to say real quick that I would say because the universe is continually expanding, that he has big plans in store for the for the rest of uh, eternity, because he's continually creating. You know, I I'm glad Mike said that because that's something I have always told people. I said, you know, God does not create things with no intent. I mean, he doesn't wastefully create things. Um, he has a purpose behind his creation in everything that he creates. So all these galaxies, these worlds, all these things that exist out there, the rest of the universe, is just waiting to me. I mean, we spend so much of our time as human beings just admiring uh, the stars, admiring, you know, I, at least I know I do. I've always been a stargazer. I've always, been, I've always just been looked up at the sky in a nice clear winter night and seen all those stars and just been so amazed and just gives you the idea how small we are in, in God's massive universe that, 
you know, there's got to be a purpose and a reason for all that out there. He put it there in place for a purpose. And I think this definitely, I agree with Mike. I mean, this definitely speaks to that, in my opinion, in my opinion. And I think that it's it's just a, a, a degree of simple deductive reasoning that, yeah, he's put it out there for a reason, and we're going to take part in that in, in eternity. <laughs> let, me, let me quote uh, uh, Eric, chapter 1, verse 1. Eric said... God had fun creating. <laughs> I've he never did. heard anybody say that. I think that's so beautiful, the idea of God just having so much fun, just God loving to create. And uh, uh, I hope more people will uh, you know, understand it in that simple way, that God is creator, uh, and why would he stop creating? I mean, eternity you know, is beyond, it's mind-boggling. We cannot even comprehend what eternity is. We think in terms of finite. You know, there's a beginning and an end. And even the idea of, of God being uh, no beginning and no end, it boggles our mind. So the idea of eternity, such a long time, why wouldn't God want to continue creating if he's having fun doing it? Okay, so here's something that is probably going to be a, I think we'll enjoy this part of it, the, the talk, but we have brothers lately that have come out with videos really discounting and poo-pooing the concept of rewards. There's two brothers that we all love very much that have recently said uh, the idea of, of like getting rewards is, is ridiculous. We shouldn't even be thinking about it. They don't think about it, and it's just like, and yet, uh, all the time, all through Scripture, it says, "Build up your treasures in heaven," and talks about getting these crowns. And so, I don't think that we're told all about these rewards, uh, and, and then expected to not think about it, not strive for it, not uh, not to look forward to it. But we should like poo-poo the whole concept. Uh, so now we're going to talk about another type of reward here that Randy sees. It says uh, service as a reward. Mm -hmm. Those coming out of the Great Tribulation will be specially rewarded by being given a place, quote, before the throne of God, unquote, where they will, quote, serve him day and night, unquote. That's Revelation chapter 7. Notice that the master rewards his faithful servants not by taking away responsibilities, but by giving them greater ones. Mm -hmm. I mean, what do you think? Is that that's like a mind-boggling. That to me, uh, I think to a lot of people, the idea of having responsibility, having a big job. I mean, some people all are ambitious. They want to have the biggest job. They want to be the CEO of the biggest company. They want to be a, a, a leader in the biggest government. They want that responsibility. They love it. Just like God has fun creating. Some people have fun with taking on responsibilities. And so uh, is, it, is it out of line to think that people could look at getting a responsibility assigned to them as being a reward? You know, it could be, it could be too, that rewards are somewhat tailored to our personality types because God has made us all different and everything. And maybe it could be that the tribulation saints that... Uh, that, that Randy is referring to right here are kind of collectively as a group that type and everything. So giving them that reward is perfect for them. Why well, I tend to agree with Jackson on that. I mean, I, because it rewards as Christ describes, and he talks about treasures in heaven and about rewards. Um, they seem to be tailored specifically to us on a personal level. Um, so I, I would agree with that. I, th I think that it, it, I think they are going to be tailored to each of us uh, individually on a personal level for for the things that we're good at, the things that uh, the things that you know what our creativity is, what our good uh, our good um, traits are, what we what we tend to be good at. Um, I think they will be tailored towards that. Yeah, I'm, and I, I think that uh, you know uh, I've heard some people say that they don't want you know, to rule over a city, and they don't want to, they don't want to uh, you know, uh, have a big mansion. They just want to sit in the rocking chair and rest and relax, you know, and that's, that's what they think is, would be nice. But I, I think that when we are in this state 
where it's joy, ecstasy, bliss, and everything is so beautiful that, I mean, I can see me wanting to really play Pebble Beach and Augusta and all these golf courses and stuff, and after maybe a, a year or five years or a hundred years or a million years, at a certain point in time, maybe golf will lose its luster, and I would say, there's some other interests I have. What about getting a big job? From, from God, maybe God will give me a big job and I can have something he wants me to do that will be really exciting. Mm -hmm. and I can see that that could be really a, a reward in eternity when you think of how mind-boggling uh, creation will be and we're going to be having some kind of job dealing with uh, creation and, and continuing, I don't know. Who well, knows? yeah, you know, they're called rewards. Something is a reward by its nature, is something you like, enjoy, and want. It's not some. You're not going to be given something as a reward that you don't want, or else it's not really a reward, is it? So, I mean, you know, and that's why again we go back to what Jackson said. What I was saying, I think they will be tailored towards us individually. But it'll be based on our our desires, our wants, the things that we like. Um, of course, uh, and of course, there's things that are acceptable in the eyes of God. Um, so, so yeah. I mean, it, I mean, rewards are based on things you would want, not something you wouldn't want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'd be a punishment that's if you didn't want it. <laughs> that's a very good point. It would. Some sometimes all you gotta do is look at what does a word mean. <laughs> like that's what you just did. I mean, what maybe that's word, maybe that's oversimplifying it, but I I just why my, don't complicate things don't don't people need to stop complicating matters they don't you know um and may, maybe people say that they don't want those things cuz secretly they do and they think by saying it that they'll get those things <laughs> because so there's there's remember that's that pious thing we were talking about I, and I'm not saying that that's what people are doing I'm just saying you know some people tend to say well I'm going to say I don't want anything and maybe by saying that I'm going to get more rewards because I'm saying I don't want anything <laughs> mhm mm yeah Okay, service is a reward, not a punishment. The idea is foreign to people who dislike their work and only put up with it until retirement. We think that faithful work should be rewarded by a vacation for the rest of our lives. But God <laughs> offers us something very different, more work, more responsibilities, increased opportunities, along with greater abilities, resources, wisdom, and empowerment. We will have sharp minds, strong bodies, clear purpose, and unabated joy. The more we serve Christ now, the greater our capacity will be to serve him in heaven. That's, it's making it sound very exciting to me now, and even well, though... I think we can to turn him in there real quick. He's going to reward them by giving them more rewarding work. Okay, well, when you just tend to say more work, people tend to say, "Oh, more work! I don't, I don't want to work. I want to." But this is going to be rewarding work. This is going to be like, you know, that we talk. About, yeah, I mean, we, we talk about jobs. You know, like one, one of the. Right, right. I mean, we we say, you know, there's a saying, and I love to tell people this. You know, love what you do, and it's a famous saying, but it's like, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. That's what heaven's going to be like. It's going to be something that we're going to love and want to do so that it's going to be the most rewarding things that we can do. And will, we'll, um, you know, having fun be part of that? Will, we'll, we'll, um, I don't know, playing in some way something? Sure, of course. I mean, I mean, there are other... There are other things to do than just work. I mean, there, there, there are other things to enjoy. Yeah, I think your point is is really the the right perspective is that uh, most people. I'm, I'm guessing, at least in the, in this country, maybe all around the world, this is true. I would say probably ninety, maybe ninety five percent of all people. Uh, work is drudgery. They don't. It's not something they would choose to do. They're only there because they need the money. Uh, and and uh, there are a few people. Every once in a while, I meet someone that that even if they weren't get, getting paid, that's what they would do, because they just love doing it. Whether it's maybe fishing, taking people on uh, fishing trips or something, they'd go fishing anyway, whether someone was going on the trip or not. They just love to do it. So there are some people that they've made their vocation their. Uh, they're, I mean, they've made their avocation into their vocation, so they they can actually get paid for doing something they would do for free. But mm -hmm. 
and that's that's the perspective. We're the kind of work that we'll be doing and the responsibilities are things that are going to be we would we would just love to do. Yes. Okay. Um, well, probably a good thing you won't be able to get fired either. <laughs> well, once, once you're hired, you, you're in. You you have you have to do the job, and there's no getting around it anymore. You saying you saying that you get a job for life? Ever? Yeah, you get a job for life. Jo you got eternal job security. Yeah, exactly. How about, how about job, that? Yeah, like that's good. That's a good one. Eternal no one no security. unemployment line. Yeah, like it's job for life, everlasting. Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, Randy the, I just want one more. The, the savings plan plan is out of this world. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know that uh, putting our faith in Jesus is eternal life insurance. Absolutely. Uh, reigning over cities will certainly not be, quote, having nothing to do, unquote. I believe that those who rule cities on the new earth will have leisure, rest, and will fully enjoy it, but they will have plenty to do. Dallas Willard suggests, quote, perhaps it would be a good exercise for each of us to ask ourselves, really, how many cities could I now govern under God? If, for example, Baltimore or Liverpool were turned over to me with power to do what I want with it, how would things turn out? An honest answer to this question might be, might do much to prepare us for our eternal future in this universe." Unquote. In other words, how prepared are you really to, to rule over a city? You know? <laughs> Will everyone be given the opportunity to rule in the new universe? The Apostle Paul said that eternal rewards are available uh, not only to me, but also to all who have longed for, the, for his appearing, 2 Timothy. The word all is encouraging. The Lord will reward everyone for whatever good he does, whether he is slave or free. That's Ephesians chapter 6. The word everyone is again encouraging. It won't be just a select few rewarded with positions of leadership. Uh, I won't, it makes me wonder though, you know, if everybody's leading, who's going to be following? You know, and uh, ser serving. You know, if if you're ruling, there's some people serving. Uh, so uh, there's got to be like some kind of a balance and perspective here. What do you think? Well, you're going to have one of the things that I it comes to mind for me is you're going to have whole generations coming up in the millennium that are, you know, are going to come up in a world that have no knowledge of history before that. You know, they're they're going to not know what the Earth was like before that happened. They're they're not going to they're not going to know a world uh, that knew sin. They're not going to know the way things were, you know, wars and death, and they're not going to know any of that. Um, you know, maybe maybe the history of that's going to be something to be, you know, handed down the great things that God has done. Of course, God's word will always continue, so we know. If that's true, then the history that's in God's Word, God's Word is not just it's not just a manual of instruction. It's all it's also a history book. It also tells the history of man. So um, that's going to live on forever as well. Uh -huh. Yeah. Let's see. Um, should we be excited that God will reward us by making us rulers in His kingdom? Absolutely. Jesus said, Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. See, now that shoots right down the whole idea that, you know, some people are poo-pooing rewards. Jesus himself, Rejoice, be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. And it's, uh, it's important people understand that receiving eternal life in heaven is not the reward. That's the gift we get that we don't deserve, we don't earn, uh, through our works, uh, we receive it because God is gracious and will give it to us when we put our faith in the Savior. So uh, the, the, most people in the world have the misconception that going to heaven is the reward. But no, that's the gift. Once you receive the gift, then you're eligible to receive these rewards. And Jesus said we should rejoice that we can get these rewards. 
Jackson. Uh huh. So what does that what does that give you a perspective towards uh, you know wanting to receive rewards? How do you feel about that now? De de oh. Delayed hand hand clap coming, eventually. Okay. Um, I, I it's hard. This is kind of a hard issue for me because every time. Well, I shouldn't say every time, but the primary thing that happened to me where I was put in responsibility over other people didn't go very well. Let's just put it that way. And yeah, I don't have a far greater far greater capacity than you do now. I mean, I don't know. I I I guess I always thought because rewards are tailored to the individual, I can't imagine my reward be me ruling things. Although or at least ruling a lot of things, ruling some because I, I want that rod of iron to be able to stem with. So, yeah. well, I think rather you're just one of these humble people that just kind of plays down your uh, your your aptitudes and abilities. Uh, uh, I right now, I, even at your age, I think you'd probably be a pretty wise ruler. I think that you have uh, really good uh, uh, patience and. Uh, um, Fairness. So I, I think you have a lot of good qualities that you you'd be a very good ruler. You know, it's funny. Jackson says those things, but that's the exact pattern that God has used through history for the people who He tends to pick as rulers. <laughs> he, yeah, you know, they tend to be the ones that I, I'm not a good person to do that. I I don't think um Look at Moses. I'm not I'm not up for that. Right, Moses. So he kept using every excuse in the book. I'm not a good speaker. I I, I can't do this. So and those are the people that God says that's exactly why I want you for it. That's exactly why I want you for it. You know, so you you may find that that's exactly. Why he's going to want you for it? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, he says the 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 humble will be exalted, the the proud will be humbled, or uh, whatever. And, and it says the first will be last, the last will be first. So there's examples that that make us think that maybe someone like Austin, who is humble and is not really like, uh, uh, you know, thinking in terms of ambition and ruling a lot of cities, maybe that's the type of man that that uh, God will say. That's who I want. That's who I want for the job, right? <laughs> Jackson, Jackson's humble. He's, he'll be first. Uh, God will choose who reigns as kings, and I think some great surprises are in store for us. Christ gives us clues in Scripture as to the type of person he will choose. Quote, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. God opposes the proud, but give grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. So there's plenty of scripture examples that are going to give, say, Jackson, you're going to be quite surprised with your cities you're ruling and the responsibility you're given, and you're going to love it. <laughs> I would love to be like a film director in heaven. Can I have that reward? <laughs> <laughs> a film director, huh? Yeah. Yeah. I wonder what kind of technology we're going to have for for a writer or special uh, effect or something yeah. like that. Look or around you. Version of Roger Corman. <laughs> <laughs> Look around you to see the meek and the humble. They may include street sweepers, locksmiths, assistants, dr bus drivers, or stay-at-home moms who spend their days changing diapers, doing laundry, packing lunches, drying tears, and driving carpools for God. I once gave one of my books to a delightful hotel bellman. I discovered he was a committed Christian. He said he'd been praying for our group, which was holding a conference at the hotel. Later, I gave him a little gift, a rough wooden cross. He seemed stunned and overwhelmed. With tears in his eyes, he said, You didn't need to do that. I'm only a bellman. The moment he said it, I realized that this brother had spent his life serving. It will likely be someone like him that I'll have the privilege of serving under in God's kingdom. He was only a bellman, unquote, uh, who spoke with warmth and love, who served, who quietly prayed in the background, for, six, for the success of a conference in his hotel, I saw Jesus in that bellman, and there was and there was no only about him. Uh, who will be the kings of the new earth? I think that bellman will be one of them. 
and I'll be honored to carry his bags. Okay, so that's the end of that chapter. We'll pick up uh, on uh, Section 8, Chapter 23 next time. Uh, let's rehash anything that uh, from this that uh, we'd like to re review and, and then close. Uh, you missed uh, some, uh, brother, brother Mike. Uh, Jackson was uh, not there at the very beginning either, but uh, anything that you guys have heard that you think that uh, uh, are worth uh, re-emphasizing? No? Okay. Uh, then uh, let's tell the people, since now they know how wonderful heaven's going to be, let's tell the people uh, how they can have heaven, how they can have eternal life in heaven. Uh, Brother Jackson, you know all about it. Would you tell us uh, what they need to do, what they need to know? Tell them, so, tell them what they need so that they can have eternal life in heaven. You know, the Bible says, according to the, you know, it's interesting how contrary the Bible is to what we naturally think and everything. Because what, what the Bible says about how to go to heaven is we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've all come short of his perfection. So what, Jesus, what, what God did is he sent his perfect son, Jesus Christ, who is God in the flesh, to die on a cross as payment and punishment for our sins. He was nailed to the cross. He was buried, and then he rose again on the third day, three days after his resurrection, and offers eternal life to sinners who simply believe on him for this gift. Amen. Amen. Um, so, uh, what, what is it exactly they must do then? You must put all your faith in what Jesus did and not your own efforts. Yes. You must believe that he gives it to you as eternal life. You cannot say, this will not work if you say, I believe in Jesus, but I also think I have to live a good life and be water baptized to get this. That cancels the payment. Okay. Except as a gift or not, or not at all. Okay. So that, that brings us to the, the, the question of what is the primary error? Of, of all the religions of the world, including much of what people call Christianity, but it's not really biblical Christianity. What is the primary error when people, when you ask them what they have to do to go to heaven? What's the big error? The big error is they think it's their own merit. Yes. Or a combination of Jesus and them, or some, something that involves them in some way doing good yeah. to attain heaven, thinking yeah. it's the reward instead of the gift, like you said earlier. Yes, so so a person needs to come to the conclusion that they're helpless to do this, to accomplish it, and they need to be saved. That it's uh, They cannot do it on their own, and mm -hmm. uh, they need to rely completely on our Savior, Jesus. And you told the people who he is and what he did, uh, and uh, I, I think that one thing that needs to be reemphasized is he was dead and buried, but he raised himself from the dead. And uh, the, the significance of that is that's the proof that he is God and that he does have the power of life and death. This is why we can have confidence in putting our faith in him because he showed us his power over life and death. So Jesus is worthy of your faith and your trust. Uh, just put your faith completely in him and reject the idea that you can do it on your own without him and, and understand that nothing is required except putting your faith completely in the Savior. Does anybody want to add anything to, to, to those ideas? Uh, if you don't want to go to heaven, then it would be the exact opposite of that. You would keep trying to perfect the flesh the whole time and rejecting the grace of God and uh, fully, you know, say, thinking you, that that you have to clean clean up your life before you can receive that free gift, which the Bible calls it. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, before I close, uh, Brother Eric, do you have anything to, to add? Um. 
I just wanted to add to that that you know th these attempts from people to say I have to do something, I have to do something. It's really insulting to what God has provided for you, because what you're saying in essence is that what Jesus did is not good enough for you. Um, he did not accomplish it. He couldn't accomplish it without your help. And to do that completely discounts what he's done. It, it, it takes away the incredible power in what he accomplished at the cross and what it meant for us. So it's much easier to simply surrender, and that's kind of what Jackson was talking about. You know, it's funny how the Bible, you know, it tells you to do the exact opposite of what we would think to do as people. You know, as people, you're told to be control freaks about your life. But God tells us we got to surrender. God tells us we got to give up. He tells us we have to say, I admit, I can't do this. I'm not capable of doing it. So it's at that point where you reach that, that level where you say, I need someone to do this for me. And the only person who can do that is Jesus. And I'm going to let him take care of all of it. Now, I'm not going to try to do this myself. This is for him to do. And then I'm simply going to try and be the best child for God that I can be out of obedience and love for him. Mm -hmm. Amen. Okay, I, I think that people know what they need to know, and, and uh, the question is faith. Do you have faith in the Savior? But the problem I've encountered is that uh, I meet a lot of people that have faith, but their faith is in themselves. They're putting their faith in their own ability to be a good person, and if they're just good enough, they'll please God, and he'll accept them. But they have to reject the idea uh, of putting faith in themselves and say, I'm a failure. I can't do it. Instead, I have to put my faith in the Savior instead. If you do that, if you're watching this now, and, and, and you you're decide you understand this, and you, and you decide, I need Jesus. Jesus, be my Savior. I'm going to depend on you completely and not myself. He'll give you eternal life, and you can heal it forever in heaven with us, and we'll have a blast together. The joy, ecstasy of bliss is going to be beyond our imagination. It's a free gift. He's offering it to you now. If you do it, uh, let us know. Make a comment on this video, and uh, we will celebrate to hear that good news. All right? Uh, so uh, thank you for watching. I'm going to end the live broadcast now. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.